What's up guys, Hyperbits here. So so this is gonna be my first time just doing kind of like a full on production walkthrough of one of my tracks. And and hopefully like I'll be sharing some cool stuff in here. Um, this is a project of a track I made called Piano, which just came out on mine and Shane 54's label Ride, Record Ride Recordings earlier this week. And um, and yeah, like I, I think, you know, like I was saying, this is the first time I'm doing one of these walkthroughs. So hopefully I'll be doing more of them in the future. So just make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, leave some comments, questions, and I will make sure to respond to all of you guys. And, and yeah, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll get something out of this. All right, so I'll get going with the drums and eventually work my way through all like 90 something layers of this track. And to start, I'm just gonna play a quick little bit of the drop so that you guys can kind of tell where we are in the context of this project. And I'll start with this, uh, this kick beef layer here. It's basically just something I made uh, with the Nicky Romero kick synth, which I bounced down to audio. Um, nothing really too crazy going on. I'm pretty sure I just messed around with like a preset, tuned it to the track, which is in G, uh, and and tweaked the decay of the kick so that it fit nicely in this in this project, which is in 126 BPM. Basically, what I mean by that is that I just make sure that my kicks are never longer than halfway between two kicks. Right, so like, I'm just making sure that the that this all this space is left open, so that I'm not like I don't have this super long kick that's conflicting with like other basses, um, low tonal percussive sounds. Just basically leaving this space open so that I can fill it in with, very easily without really having to worry about it conflicting with the kick. Uh, as far as processing goes, let me play this kick for you. Basically just, um, I mean, there's a lot of amazing things about the, the FabFilter Pro Q2, but one of the, like the most simplistic reasons that this is such an awesome plugin is that it tells you the, the note of what frequency you're at. So instead of like going to Google and like typing in like frequency charts and like having to find it, like you can just sweep right through in here. Um, and, and I don't know, I just find that pretty sweet and, and very beneficial so that if I wanted to do uh, an EQ bump in the key of G it's, I can just hone in right on um, 49 Hertz and do like a 2 dB boost um, with a pretty narrow relatively narrow Q. <clears throat> I've also got a little bit of limiting here I mean it's, I'm actually not using the Oxford limiter as a limiter here I'm using the enhance curve which is a lot like the Sonics inflator it's just it's just pushing up the kick drum a little bit. It's got a good sound to it. I like to throw this thing on on kick drums. The kick top layer is actually just a, a kick that um, I, I I use all the time, and I got it from a free sample pack that this really awesome producer by the name of Nigel Good recommended. He had actually heard of it from just on Reddit. And I think it's called Deuce Box Kicks and Snares. I'll, I'll make sure that there's links in the description so that you guys can snag like anything that's free that I talk about. But yeah, this layer is just meant to add a little bit of attack to the kick and just help it cut through the mix. And, and I just kind of like, I like the sound of it, especially when I play them um, both together. This intro loop, I'm not exactly sure where this is from. But that's it's, its sole purpose is to add a little bit of groove to the intro. Um, I did a little bit of reductive EQ to kind of take away some of the low end and some of the harshness from up top. And, and you'll see that I kind of, I end up doing this a decent amount. Um, and on top of the fact that like sweeping through four harsh frequencies can help clean up sounds. It's also going to help with headroom, like at the end of the day when you're trying to make this track kind of loud and, and commercially competitive. Um, and it's it's one thing to do it with, you know, this one layer, but imagine doing this to every single channel in your mix 
and all of a sudden you're going to have just like a ton more headroom and all of your sounds will essentially be be cleaner and you'll be able to push the limiter at the end of your master chain much further um, you know to generate some serious loudness but uh, but anyway I've also got a little bit of pan man on here I'm just trying just I love to make things alive and move and I think anytime that something feels static or dull I'm, I'm prone to to try to make it move a little bit so that's all the pan man is doing here kind of panning a little left and right but, but relatively narrow still This deep loop is another, um, just another another loop that it, it has a current sound to it. And I mean, this song is not deep by any means, but but deep sounds like and deep house being very in. I just like to borrow from that whenever I can and kind of just put my own little spin on some of these sounds. And I think in this case. Um, you know, it's just it's just a deep sounding loop, like a Tachami type loop, um, and it kind of works well. Uh, this open hat is j another just like a 909 sample. I'm using a little bit of sample delay to push it out to the right side of the speakers. Um, it's it's kind of my way of like like I I mean you can you can do a little bit of panning or you can use a little bit of sample delay. Sample delay for me is just gonna create a more interesting stereo image than simply panning, but I, I like to do a little bit of both. Uh, and and usually like I'll apply like a different amount of sample delay and panning to create space on almost every single drum layer. And this is my way of just making sure that everything is, is in its own place in the mix and not kind of conflicting with each other as far as the stereo image goes. And I really, really love doing this with drums. Um, I think it plays a huge role in just getting like your commercially polished sound. Um, and, and it's something that I go into like really, really big detail in um, in my master class. This hat groove also something that it's just another sample from I have I have like 600 gigs of samples, so it's hard to remember where everything comes from. A uh, little bit of sample delay again. Looks like I didn't even do any EQ on this. Probably should have. Uh, the, this crash right here is actually a Zeko and Torres sample. If any of you guys aren't using Splice, you really need to get on there just just for the fact that like I mean. Well, actually, a couple things. They're they're basically revolutionizing the way that like producers purchase or hunt for samples. But on top of that, they've like they've partnered with all these like awesome artists who are just uploading their entire stem sessions to Splice, and that means that we get to go in there and just see what these guys are up to, and most importantly, we get to take some of their sounds. So, you know, we get to use them in our own productions. And I think that's like just really, really sweet because you can kind of see how your project hones up to some of the sounds that these guys are using. So this is just a, a nice crash. Uh, this is a nice clap from them as well. This is a nice uh, ride symbol, not from the Zeko and Torres project, but again, from something, from some project that I got from someone with a, with a nice ride that's supposedly directly from Alesso. Now I'm just gonna jump to like the, the snare build. Where is that? Over here. So I used another snare from another pack that someone posted on Reddit. <clears throat> I'll make I'll make sure to link it in the description, but I think it's called like the Sessa sample pack. And there's just some pretty solid sounds in there. I mean, there's not too much going on here, right? It's just it's just a very well done sample that didn't need too much adjusting to kind of sound good in this project. Um, as the track builds, I have like some of these snares pitching up. Ooh. 
which is a lot. It's gonna go a long way for me. And just to kind of keep jumping around the the uh, the drum sounds here, I I apparently loved the sound when I was making this track, but um, this is just kind of a cool tonal sample that I used to create some like additional groove in the track. And I'm actually sending a to a ton of reverb here and sidechaining the reverb, and that's going to contribute to the kind of the vibe of this sound. And I even threw on, looks like, some of the Faturator. This thing has a lot of like nice fuzz and drive. It's just a distortion or saturation tool. But if I turn this thing off, I'm sure you'll hear it kind of come down. Like, yes, it makes it louder, but it also makes it just like, it's got like a fuzziness to it that I think fills in the sound nice. And there's also a little bit of uh, Echo Boy from Sound Toys. Right, just adds a little bit of movement, a little bit of depth. Um, really like the way that uh, you know adding a little bit of echo can can uh, contribute to some of the sounds in, in projects like this. Now, over here I've got some wood grooves. This, I'm kind of jumping to the to the break section, but check out the sample. Not playing like the biggest role ever as far as uh, sounds in this track, but it it does add a, a lot of energy, and and I really liked the sound of these kind of wood grooves. And so, what happened though when I tried putting it into the track, like it was very like not tuned to the track. Like these are these wood tones or these wood grooves have like tonality to them. And so if I turn off what I used to tune it was the uh, Sound Toys Alter Boy, but if I turn this off. Right, completely different sound. Probably could have gotten away with it, but I just wanted it to be more tuned to the track. And so what I did was throw on the Alter Boy and then just tune it to the track using using my ears. But See if there's anything else that I wanted to go over as far as the drums go. Oh, um, bussing. I I definitely, yeah. I sent all the drums to a bus. I so as far as grouping my drums, I, I usually kind of keep things pretty minimal on a, on a bus scale or on the bus level. I did a little bit of of Fab Filter EQ here. Um, I like to switch this thing into mid side EQ and just cut away some of like the unnecessary side information in the low end. What's cool here is like so when you when you switch this thing into mid side over here, you can select what kind of EQ like what you want to address. Do you want to address the middle of the mix? Do you want to address the sides? And then you can you can solo what it is that you're working on. So if I if I I'm gonna play like the the drums right now. Actually, I'll go more to the drop. So this is all the drums. And if I solo just the sides of the drums, you'll hear a little bit of low end information. Might have to turn your speakers up a little bit to hear this, but check this out. You want your low end information on your sides to be pretty much mono below 200 hertz. I mean, you can be, you can make that a little less or more. I like to be pretty much mono below 200. So if I if I want like a really tight low end, I can cut this a little further. But I think it's worth mentioning that this is going to contribute a lot to just tightening up the drum sounds in general. Is cutting away the sides of the mix below maybe 250 or 200 in this case. And then um, it looks like I'm also just cutting a little bit of the mids below 55 hertz. 
you know, like I've got a kick drum that's doing a lot of low end work. I think this was just kind of um, almost like a precautionary measure so that some of this low end information, like the toms that are coming through to uh, to just be cut. Um, and this won't really won't make the, the drums feel weaker or anything like that or, or less subby. I also gave the drums a little bit of Devil Lock Deluxe. I like to throw this thing on my drums to give them a little bit of like global dirt. This thing is actually an emulation of like this 1950s compressor that was so shitty that it actually sounded good. And if you play around with like your crush and crunch settings on this thing, I, I never really use the darkness, but um, overall, if you play around this thing, you can get some really like crazy. Uh, intense dirty drum sounds and in this case I'm using a very very tiny amount right like the mix there's a mix knob here so it's kind of like parallel compression but I can dial in just a little bit of this mix and it's gonna make the drums kind of have this like global dirtiness to them I'll, I'll dial it up so you guys can hear it easier Right, that's a drastic amount. Even even a small amount like that, you can hear pretty easily uh, if you're if you're listening closely. Uh, and then the last thing that I did on the bus was just throw on a little bit of SSL bus compression. What I like to do is set my compressors to to some of their least sensitive settings and and just kind of like dial in a little bit of the threshold and and see how much gain reduction I'll get usually around um, one to two dBs is all I'll all I'll ever really shoot for and this is again to just kind of like give the drums a, a bit of of global compression something to give them some similarities and and just kind of pump together so let me reset this threshold and I'll set it for you guys <laughs> Right, so it's never really peaking above 2 dBs of gain reduction, and, and that's kind of what, um, what I'm looking for when it comes to addressing like my drums on a, on a global scale or global level. And yeah, that's really about it for drums. You know, there's, there's really not that much crazy stuff going on in this track. Uh, I, I do like to make a lot of my own loops, but I felt that at this point that the track was getting a bit too cluttered if I was going to be adding any anything else to the track. So, yeah, I mean a lot, you know, a lot of meticulous sample selection, uh, some simple processing, and and I thought that was you know plenty for the drums in this track. All right, so with the bass here, everything kind of revolves around this main bass sound. Um, and, and usually I like to write my bass lines, or really like any part of the song, f I like to write first before diving too far into sound design. But in this case, I actually played around with the sound first, and I think that's what led me to kind of write this weird bending bass line riff. <laughs> So let me take off all the plugins and you'll be able to hear what this sounded like uh, before it was processed. <laughs> right? It's, it's crazy, right? Like just how much the bass just completely drops off. And that's because of like this silent patch, I'm pretty sure it's just a, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just like, um, like a little saw wave, right? With a little release on the envelope and that's it. Uh, but so Amicide is going to be doing like a ton of work here. Um, and, and I would honestly recommend playing around with like all the presets in Amicide and then tweaking those sounds to kind of fit your sound or, or fit your track. But there's some really, really powerful presets inside of Amicide, specifically the bass presets. Really awesome stuff. <laughs> And 
And then from there, I added a little bit more saturation with the soft tube saturation knob, which, by the way, it's a free plugin, and I'll I'll add it to the description um, so that you guys can download it. And and then there's some let's see here some reductive EQ, um, maybe just getting rid of some some maybe a harsh point here, maybe like a muddy spot here. Although that looks a little bit too high to be muddy but I'm sure there was a purpose behind that little cut at some point. Um, and, and then there's a pretty substantial like boost here, which I normally don't do. Like I, I really try to not do too much additive EQ inside of Logic's EQ. I'll use like third party plugins with that, but I guess this was an exception. I was, I was probably feeling pretty lazy and just didn't want to reach for another plugin. Uh, the wow filter is is really awesome because you can like, you can just really make things come to life and move with this thing. Uh, if you right click on the main knob here, you can modulate the LFO, the LFOs so that it kind of goes between like the, the vowel sounds that this thing is basically known for. And you can play around with the dry wet of this. I kind of have it pretty far dry. I didn't want like the, the wow filter to be too recognizable. A little bit of side chain for some pump. This is giving the, the bass line a lot more color. This is like a plugin usually meant for, um, for vocals, but in this case, like I think because I mean, well, there's several several reasons that I kind of I think decided to use this, but um, but in this case, right, this track isn't really a vocal driven track, so I thought it would be cool to kind of take some of the color from the mid range that I usually apply to vocals and just throw it on the bass to kind of make this like very much the forefront and kind of in the face of the listener. Uh, let's see, we've got the fab filter here. Oh, I did like a little stereo bump. So the way we I was showing you guys before, a little bit of like mid side EQ, you can just leave the default settings of the fab filter in left, right, and then you can EQ the left and the right sides of the speaker differently. And this is just cool because it enhances stereo differences, right? It makes things feel a little bit wider because you can boost things in, or boost frequencies on different sides of the speakers. Uh, this isn't like too drastic of a move, but I just thought it was pretty cool. And we've got some sausage fatter and and sausage, you know, always always in moderation. Uh, and then I think there's just a gain plugin for some like some volume automation. Um, and and that's pretty much it for the main base. Oh, I did want to show you guys like some of these pitch bends in here. Make sure that when you're doing pitch bends that you set your bend range in whatever synth you're using to 12 or 24 semitones. That's gonna make sure that when you bend all the way down or up on a given sound, uh, it will stay in key. And last thing I wanted to say about this main bass, like a few months ago, I'd actually put together like an, an hour long webinar specifically about saturation and distortion. And a lot of the examples and techniques that I went over um, were actually from this song uh, when it was still a work in progress. So like, just make sure to to check out that link. I'll, I'll put it in the description and you guys could just check that out if you want to dive a little further into some of the concepts that kind of derive this project and, and you know, some of the concepts that I teach in my master class. Um, but anyway, to keep going from there, let's see what's going on in this sub. So this sub is actually pretty straightforward. Let's see, we've got the, the ace. Um, this is a, a patch that I, I grabbed directly from a fair play tutorial. You know, like I, I, I paused a YouTube video, uh, recreated it, uh, and it's just like a really nice sub and it has some, some clickiness to the top of it, which I usually remove, but just so you guys can hear that, hear that. I usually remove that clickiness, but it's cool to be able to EQ some of it out and, and leave some of it in other instances when you want a little bit of attack from your sub, which is like a rare thing to kind of get, I think, out of your subs. 
but but yeah nothing again nothing too crazy going on here i think i've got a little bit of saturation again from the soft tube but i like to keep my subs pretty clean uh, i don't want to do too much to them the wet top layer this this layer is all about creating some some width and stereo image in the base and so i cut out a lot of the low end here because if i'm if i'm trying to spread something out i really don't want a lot of low end information And what's, what's really adding to the width here is going to be this reverb directly on the channel. And then there's a little bit of OTT to just give it that color and that brightness that you know everyone loves from the OTT. The bass future layer was kind of a current sound, you know, like very Oliver Heldens, um, just derived from, from Nexus 2. It's from the Deep House expansion pack. But, you know, this is a progressive groove driven track, and I thought it'd be cool to incorporate some of like those future housey sounds in like a slightly different way. And I think in the context of the track, like if I play the whole drive, you don't really even hear it, but you, I mean, you do, but you just, you don't even really know that it's there. There's a some Saturn being used here. Definitely amplifies it a bit, changes the the sound a good amount. The bass noisy layer, uh, it just kind of keeps the bass growing and getting bigger throughout this whole section. This layer is probably doing the least out of anything out of all these layers. But it's it's got that like, I, I don't know, I always think of like a Tiesto track or something. It's just like a noisy layer for energy. Um, and it's kind of like, it's a little bit of an obnoxious layer, but it, but you know, it, it works for, for what it's, or for the, what it's trying to achieve. <laughs> Uh, and if I were to jump around here, let's just go to the, yeah, let's go to the intro bass. I gave the, the bass, I, bas I basically bounced the bass down to audio, low cut it, applied a little bit of the Synopsis creative filter. This thing is just a nice colored filter. I'll, I'll, I'll show you what it's doing. Right, it's the color. It's that like that that crispy sound to it. Um, just really, really nice sounding filters. If you if you don't have your hands on any of the Synopsis stuff, I would I'd definitely recommend it. Uh, let's go to the bass in the break. So this sub is the same sub as before, just without sidechain. And what's really giving the bass a lot of warmth and impact in this break is, is going to be this drone. I'm a really big fan of drones. They just kind of warm up and, and fill out break sections very well. Uh, this patch specifically is from Silent. It's from an Umet or Umet Askin uh, sound bank, which very great sounds. It's actually pretty old. It's like three or four years old, but uh, but still very good sounds. If you want to grab anything from there, uh, and and uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, I, I did the same thing that I did with like that intro filtering. Um, with the Synopsis filter, I did kind of a similar thing over here with this build. Except I did it manually, and you can kind of see it happening. This thing's moving and automating.
And yeah, that's pretty much it for the base. I think I've got one more layer here for the last drop. Again, not doing a crazy amount, but I wanted I just wanted it to keep growing and I felt like if I didn't include one more layer, it would be somewhat of a letdown. Just it's pretty much just like an epic distorted layer, just just trying to achieve more of like a finishing tone for that for the last drop. And I think it definitely helps achieve that. And one of the other things that really helps achieve like that finishing tone is gonna be some of these, um, I, I, had, I had created this project in, or this song in multiple projects. So I just bounced a few of the sounds from a different project into here. But this, this stuff right here, oh no, this guy. I think that really helps uh, just, just finish off that, that last drop and make it feel a bit more climactic than the first. All right, so as far as synths go, the first thing I wanted to show you guys was just this like this dope Crider pluck. I, I straight up sampled a pluck out of a Crider track like two to three years ago. I don't even remember what song it was, but uh, with, a, with a little added reverb, this is what it sounds like. And after bouncing it down to audio and reversing it, right, you get this kind of cool introduction to the sound. And in the mix, it's just a, a really cool way to maintain interest in your track, right? Because you've got this like cool different tonal element and it's just getting reversed and, and thrown at you real quick and then it, it goes away. But it's, a, it's just a cool way to keep uh, the energy up and to keep the, um, the interest kind of going in your track. Uh, these plucks are, let's see here. I mean, these plucks create a ton of movement and energy in this next section and it looks like it's comprised of about three to four layers. Let's break them down. So this patch is from Silenth. Uh, I just, I love these plucks and I love what the processing uh, does to these plucks. Looks like I've got a low cut to start, some Pew Child compression from Waves, very expensive like emulation compressor of, uh, of the Fairchild. Uh, a little bit of OTT, actually a lot of OTT, 80%. That's, that's a lot of OTT. Then some side chain, a little bit of SPL transient designing. That's kind of going to be how these plucks have a, a, like a good amount of extra attack. I love the SPL transient designer and also the Oxford transmod. These plugins let you like turn a knob and add attack to synths or percussive elements. And it's just a great way to like, you know, derive a little bit of extra energy um, from your track without necessarily boosting the EQ. You can just like, just turn up the attack or, or even turn it down, right? If you wanted uh, less of it. A little bit of sample delay, pushing it to one side of the speaker. There's some, there's some automation moves here with the, with the one knob waves filter. It's gonna happen, yeah, it's happening quite a bit, but it creates a really cool color at certain parts. And the Echo Boy is making this thing come to life and kind of making it like bounce around the, the stereo spectrum a bit. I'll turn this up just so you guys can hear it. And, and yeah, I think uh, there's also, let's see what other automation is going on here. We've got, oh, and the there's some panning automation kind of with that filter so that it starts on one side of the speaker and then ends up in the middle. And this next channel is really just layering that, that initial sound. I'm using some generic Nexus 2 mute guitar plucks but they add, in the mix especially, they add kind of 
uh, I think the characteristic that I was looking for. A lot of similar similar automation moves. And then there's these click plucks, which is just like a, I think it's like a tonal wood click or something. Yeah, it's just like a tom or some sort of a percussive-y sound. Also has some Echo Boy on it. Similar automation. Uh, and it's adding a lot to kind of this section as a whole. <laughs> And then eventually when I when I get this section sounding a bit bigger, it's it's really due to this prid sound down here. And this prid sound is just a silent patch, really not anything that special, but it, it adds a lot more energy, um, kind of fills out the section of the drop a lot more. And, and another cool thing, so I think like at the end of this entire track, yeah, there's a little bit of automation on this pluck bus that just lets the plucks hang out a bit with delay. Kind of a cool way to finish off the track. All right, so it doesn't end so abruptly. And what I ended up doing was bouncing that delay down to audio and continuing it over here so that it doesn't disappear so quickly and then I reversed some of that audio here in the intro so that you guys can hear like kind of what this is doing right just a cool effect turn it up so you guys can hear it And now let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, and then at the end of this section, right, like we're going into a break after the first drop, which, you know, lasts about a solid minute. And instead of just having these plucks completely disappear when the when this section ends, I chose a different sound, something a lot more gentle and delicate to kind of keep these plucks going. So here, listen to this transition. It, it feels pretty seamless, but it's a completely different sound. Right, it's a lot more gentle, but if I just play these two together, you don't really, they're just completely different sounds. But it works, and I, don't, I can never really keep playing this stuff um, in the break, and, and trust me, I try. I, I always like to make my entrances into breaks as smooth as possible, and like nothing I did with this stuff was working. So I thought it was cool to just use like a different sound, something that was a lot more gentle, um, and can go into this break section, and and you know just like started off on a on a much more simple side of things. Now this ARP is really what's like, I mean, this ARP is doing a lot in the break to, to keep some interest going and to kind of drag the, drive the track forward. Uh, it has a little bit of Decimort on it, which is, I guess it's, it's a high quality bit crusher according to um, their plugin, but it, it does add some like some fuzz to it and it makes it sound a lot more analog. I'll play it with and without. And honestly, it's, it's really crazy how empty this break sounds when I don't play the ARP. Yeah, that, that ARP is doing a lot for the energy of the break. And now to move on to the, the pianos. The pianos are really comprised of four different layers here. Uh, it looks like I've got an M1 piano, a Nexus piano, 
a Forefront True Piano, and then a Logic uh, Steinway Piano from the Logic X Sampler. And and some things that I want to point out, I guess, about the pianos, I I do filter them on the on the piano bus um, so that they don't get introduced too suddenly. It's down here. All right, this is them just kind of fil the piano's filtering in. They're there somewhere, they're coming in slowly. Right, and, and over the course of 30 seconds here, the pianos are just slowly filtering in. I feel like it's a great way to introduce them. It never felt like it was abrupt. So this M1 piano has a little bit of Echo Boy to kind of help the, the piano bounce around and move. Let's see here. The Nexus piano also probably has a good amount of delay. Yeah, this one has a ton. I mean, I, I really can't stress enough how much I love Sound Toys plugins. Uh, and, and like the fact that my like that my master class students get the entire bundle at 50% off is, is just incredible. You know, like with, with a discount like that, like you can pretty much get all of the Sound Toys plugins at the cost of just like what one of their plugins usually is, which is absurd. And I mean, I could go on and on about like about Sound Toys, but I'll try, I'll try to stay focused. Although, although I actually just had an, like an idea of doing a big video like this kind of where I where I'm just using like sound toys plugins so that you guys can hear like really the the impact and the power that this suite of plugins can have on your music but um I'll, I'll write that down and move on for the time being uh, you'll also notice that a lot of these pianos are hitting some of the OTT I love pianos and OTT compressor together they just go so well together uh, and I've also got a few synths kind of mimicking the piano uh, once it once it gets into this bigger section or this bigger drop section. All right, so we've got something called, I guess, the Nexus Energy layer. This is like, it, it's really just getting some digital vibes into these kind of organic sounding real pianos. I was almost trying to get this whole section to just fill out in the digital sense like because I feel like a lot of digital plugins are gonna sound a little bit brighter than maybe some of like the analog counterparts and that's and that's a good thing like for the the real instruments like that's why real instruments kind of sound the way they do like they aren't um, consuming like the entire frequency spectrum and whereas the digital stuff you can really like I don't know, fill out a lot more. And I felt like together, all these pianos uh, kind of sounds nice. All right, moving right along here, um, let's talk about the strings. So we have like this string nexus layer, which I'm pretty sure this is a super like simple, yeah, yeah, just like a, a sharp little string layer. Again, to fill out that energy. This thing is a little crazy. There's some uh, there's some like modulation or, or something happening in the beginning of this sound. You'll hear it. Right, there's just like that little pitch bend. Um, and that's cool for this patch. It makes the patch sound alive, but when you play it all these, these short notes, it, it makes it insane. This layer here is a deep house pad from the Nexus expansion pack, the deep house expansion pack. 
Um, and you you know, like you can always make stuff move on your own, but if you're picking good patches to begin with that move a ton, you're going to be creating like much, much more lifelike productions and, and make stuff that just moves and feels less static and digital and dead. And, and that's why like I just I love finding patches that that have a good amount of, of movement to them. Even this string suspension, pretty sure it's just a, a straight up string. It's got some movement to it. It's got some nice stereo differences. And I think that's, yeah, this is gonna be the same. This is actually the same layer, but I'm just playing the, the chords now, w along with that high string layer. I think the way that I introduced these string chords is pretty cool. I'll play this and kind of talk over it since it's pretty quiet, but I've got some of that Synaxis filter happening again, right? Really like, really glossy, like filtered, shiny strings. And then they're just getting filtered down kind of to the beginning so that they sound like a nor normal strings. And that's how I introduce the strings. And I think it creates a really cool effect. You'll hear it if I play the whole thing. logic all right doing a ton there and then this sound is actually from a buddy of mine uh my friend nico just like gave me this patch and listen to what this thing does when i talk about good patch selection and just finding dope sounds like listen to what this thing does Yeah, this this patch is from is from Massive, and it's just doing so much cool stuff, and it adds a a ton of dope vibes to this. Uh, this break. All right, so this isn't a vocal track, right? But but it does have some vocal pieces or or chops to it, and and I think that's still really huge, you know, like. Like people are just gonna have so much more or, or be so much more inclined to like a song that has some small vocal parts to it um and even if it's not like a full-on vocal performance like just just these little bits of vocals uh play play a huge role i think in just keeping songs fresh and interesting and and easy to listen to and so these chops are from a freaky loops sample pack and they're all labeled by key and BPM, and so they're just very easy to work with and chop up. Uh, I think in this case, looks like just a little bit of a low end cut, a uh, little use of the Novel Tech Character plugin, a uh, little OTT, and some reverb and Echo Boy as well. Yeah, so that reverb is side chaining with the vocals. Uh, the intro vocals are probably the same thing, but probably more low cut uh, and their filters to kind of introduce them a bit more. Yeah, they're, they're filtered down in the beginning. And then this vocal build part here, also filtered. And then I use the sound shifter at the end to pitch it up. And a lot of chopping here. There's a bunch more chai. You, you can kind of treat vocals like, you know, like um, almost like percussive elements at times. They're just, they're, they're f pieces or melodic elements that you can actually use as fills. And what I mean by that is, I think I do it here. Right, it's kind of, it turns into kind of a cool fill. It's almost like a drum fill, but with vocals. And that's just some of the Echo Boy uh, to get some of that delay.
I was honestly in the break, I wanted to create a nice atmosphere and I spent a good amount of time trying to find some part of a vocal element or, or just some sort of a vocal piece that worked well alongside with these chops. And it wasn't necessarily that easy to pull off. And I eventually came across this weird humming, almost almost like chant-like vocal. Uh, chopped it up a bit, uh, low cut it a bunch, obviously some more OTT, some side chain, um, ton of reverb. And, and this vocal was really kind of gluing the entire break together. Right, if I mute that, this break is pretty much just empty. And, and yeah, that's pretty much it for, uh, for vocals in this track. All right, so let's talk about some effects in this track. Uh, I'll start by talking a little bit about this atmosphere stuff that's going on. Um, it's kind of like a village ambiance. I'll, uh, I'll play it for you guys so you know what I'm talking about. All right, I have it super, super low in the mix. But um, but I'm a really, really big fan of creating these weird, emotional, almost like like nostalgic vibes whenever I can. And, and this is just like some children talking in an Indian village. And I don't know, I feel like it makes the break a bit more eerie, but more interesting in like a global way. I don't know if I'm if I'm being that articulate right now and explaining this, but but I don't know, I hide this stuff like deep in the mix at low volumes. Uh, and even even if it's barely audible, like it just adds to this feeling that the break creates. And I also did this with some um, some waves and and seagulls here. Again, I'll turn it up so you guys can hear it. Uh, and I also did it with with uh, the vinyl this vinyl sample here. Right, and now if I play the break and mute all of these, I, I bet you'll hear it really drop off. It kind of just changes the entire vibe. Right, it starts to, it starts to sound kind of empty. It's actually pretty crazy how much these little things in the background Im impact or influence the break. Uh, moving along here, we've got some pitch risers. These are kind of cool because of like the, the pitch bends inside of this pitch riser. Right, so again, it's just kind of like pitching up and, and there's additional bends to create that energy in the movement and this another layer doing the same thing. Over here, I've got a sub rise. I, I actually got this um, idea of, in listening to a Merck and Cremont track, or I don't know how to exactly say their names, but um, there is like a, a sub riser in a lot of their buildups, and I think it's a cool way to just transfer out some of the low end maybe of the prior section. Um, and it just sounds super professional, I think. <laughs> As far as white noise, I really just kind of over time have been collecting so many white noise samples and I just know which which samples I think sound the best at this point. Um, I really like this one. There's some cool white noise cuts that I'm pretty sure I'm using the same white noise, just chopping them up. And then there's these cool fast white noise, almost reverse white noise movements. I'm a big fan of crash cymbals and throwing in the sound toys Echo Boy on these crashes to give them some nice stereo differences. And again, going back to those Deco and Torres samples, 
just some good moving white noise. I think they just threw on like a, a Sound Toys Pan Man, but saved me, saved me a step by by saving it into my into my favorites folder. And I mean, to be entirely honest, I, I don't think I need to go through all of these samples. Um, one thing I want to point out to you guys is that there's some cool tonal samples in in Vengeance. Um, what pack is it? Vengeance Fills Volume Two. There's some tonal uplifters there that are just cool. Like, you know, if you don't feel like creating uh, an uplifter from scratch every single time, these guys can really do a good job filling it out. And again, yeah, I really don't, I'm not going to go through every single sample here, but just know, I mean, I feel like the most important thing to take away from these effect samples is that it's meticulous. Like you got to like almost just take, like slow down and just pick sounds that are, are, are just going to help you polish off your productions and make like the stuff that's going on up here, you know, all the synth work and all the piano work, just kind of make that stuff shine a little extra, like cool samples, like like this little effects thing, it's like a breath. You know, in the mix, it sounds dope. And I think that happens right at the drop. Uh, even even um, these chimes down here. I think do a good job emulating this stuff like just just making stuff shine and, and kind of come to life this is a cool really nice sounding sample yeah without those chimes this section doesn't really shine this the same way um and and yeah i mean I think like, like I was saying before, like I, I just think that a lot of producers don't realize how important it is to be picking good quality samples to begin with. And aside from just like using your ears, I think there's tons of methods and, and stuff that can help you like just go about proper sound selection. And I cover a lot of this stuff extensively in my, in my master class. So um, definitely, definitely check that out um, after you've seen this whole video. All right, so just a couple things about like finishing touches to this track. I, I do a good amount of, of small moves on the master channel to just kind of accentuate some things that I did inside the mix. So for one, the first thing that I always, almost always do is before a drop, I'll send the master volume fader down maybe a dB or two so that the drop will have just a, a good amount more impact you could manually go into all your channels and lower the volume that way, but this is just a far faster, easier way to do it. So that volume move paired with a low cut can be really helpful and substantial. And I also like to automate the Q factor on the EQ. So you can see this moving. This creates a cool like DJM filter effect. I also like to sometimes lower the volume of the overall track during the break just so that there's additional dynamics. You know, everything in, in dance music seems to be getting pushed louder and louder. And this is a good way to just like create some additional dynamics by lowering the volume in the in the break sections. So that's why you got like one dB down here. Uh, aside from that, I mean, I'm not really oh, okay I'll, so i'm basically mixing into a uh like mastering or pre-mastering chain like this isn't the actual final master chain but this is just like a few plugins to generate some loudness if i took everything off like there would be you know nothing's clipping it's still relatively quiet right still have plenty of headroom or still have plenty of headroom but with these plugins on 
um, I'm just getting a better idea of what the final mastered product is going to sound like. And I think that's a really important thing to do. It helps you kind of understand like how to mix your track to be set up to be loud. And again, this is like a pretty complex, um, somewhat advanced like topic, but I feel like if you just, if you, if you have a basic understanding of what your mix needs to sound good by adding this ma a, a, some sort of a master chain to mix into your track, you're just going to be setting yourself up for what's closer to the final product. And like, there's really nothing bad about that. I know some people think that like it destroys your mix. It changes so much. I'm not really a believer in that. I think, um, I think it really helps. And a lot of like, a lot of the producers who are sounding the loudest, um, are doing the same thing.